Dear Father God, we are grateful that Jesus died on that cross for our sins at altar zero. And we're no zeros. When he became a zero, he did it so we would be someone in your eternal plan for all eternity. So Father, help us to see the truth of altar zero. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Hebrews informs us in Hebrews 13.10 that we have an altar. Now that's an amazing statement. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Friends, we don't come to God without an altar. We have an altar. The tent the Apostle Paul is talking about here in the book of Hebrews, and yes, the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Anyone who deeply studies Paul in the Greek, thematically, structurally, recognize the same person in the book of Colossians and other places in Romans and so on. Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. And in that book, he is trying to, to tell us in no uncertain terms that we have an altar. And that temple that was one of the wonders of the world in Herod's time is not a wonder anymore. Friend, Jesus was crucified on the cross of Calvary. And it, it was no longer a wonder after the, after the cross of Calvary because God abandoned that temple. God left that temple. He left it because it had left him. And he got his church moving in the direction of a new Jerusalem, a new temple, because we have an altar that is outside the gate. Hebrews 13, 14, For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. And so the book of Hebrews was given by God to get those early Christians out of the old city, out of the old sanctuary, out of the altar inside the city, and to start moving them forward in time to the city that is to come. The early Christians for the first 200 to 300 years of Christianity Look to the Mount of Olives to the east for the city that is to come. They knew good and well that God had abandoned that old city and there would be a new one that would be planted at the summit of the Mount of Olives. The, the Jewish historian Josephus, who was at the destruction of Jerusalem, he was a contemporary of it when Titus's armies came in and destroyed it in 70 A.D., he records that the Shekinah glory of God left toward the east to the Mount of Olives just before the Romans destroyed the city and the temple. But Luke, a better source of understanding, records in Acts 1 that Jesus left Jerusalem to go over the Mount of Olives when he ascended to heaven after they crucified him. The Shekinah glory was in Jesus Christ and thus Christ abandoned the old city and the old temple. Ezekiel the prophet had predicted that God's glory, the Shekinah glory, would depart from the eastern gate to the Mount of Olives as God left his old city to be destroyed because of the rebellion to seek a new temple, a new beginning in the age to come. Hebrews 13, 10 to 12. Open your Bibles and turn with me to that. You can look on the screen if you don't have one here. Again, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus, now this is, now here's the connection. The, he says the altar that we're connected with, the bodies of the animals are burned outside the camp. That zeroes in on a specific altar in the topography of that time. And then the connection in verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. There should be no mystery as to where Jesus died based on these verses. It tells us where he died. In Jesus' day, there was an altar outside the gate that was a pit where the ashes were spread and parts of the sacrifices were burnt outside the city. That place was called the altar of the red heifer. How many of you ever heard of the, the red heifer? Now, in evangelical Christianity, they're wrapping their eschatology around getting a red heifer. Because if they get a red heifer, it's perfect. They believe that you can reconsecrate the place for the temple to build a new temple in Jerusalem. And thus bring the end of days, the battle of Armageddon, and all that. Now, that's really nonsense theology. The red heifer pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That is its significance. And to insist upon an earthly sanctuary after Christ has made the transition from earth to heaven, predicted in Daniel 9, 24, that by his blood he would consecrate, he would, he would consecrate the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary. 
To insist on the earthly after that is to be pharisaical, literalistic, and to miss the teaching of Jesus. Christ left that old temple and he says, your house is left to you desolate. So we look for a city that is to come. Christ was crucified near the altar of the red heifer. It was located on the other side of the eastern gate, across the brook Kidron, near the summit of the Mount of Olives. The Hebrew word red is the Hebrew word Adam. Adam can be an adjective or a noun. As an adjective, it can be Adama or something like that, but, it, but it's still the same word. Red and Adam are the same. And so if, how many American Indians do we have here? Or I should say Native Americans. I have Native American blood in me, so I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm not offending myself. But I have strong Native American blood in me. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with having the, your skin the color of red. Maybe you go way back to Adam. And that's a good thing. How many of you like to be associated with Adam? I'm in the list, okay? So I, I have Native American blood in me. You would ju- now, you could just as easily call the red heifer the Adam heifer. And in Jesus' day, there was a large ramp that led right outside the city where the eastern gate was, directly from the, in line with the altar of, of the sanctuary in the city where you could see the veil. It went right over the Kidron, and it was high so that there would be no defilement because that was a burial ground. There were graves on the Mount of Olives. And it went right up to the sum, near the summit of the Mount of Olives. And there was a pit altar dug in the ground that was the altar of the red heifer. Near, near the altar of the red heifer, you could see the veil of the temple. In fact, the eastern gate was low enough. You could stand up there in the sun of the Mount of Olives. And by the way, that was the place of ancient execution by the Romans, especially for religious crimes. Because in their thinking of the Jews, who were Romanized also, that when you faced the sanctuary, the wrath of God rested upon you, you could see the veil of the temple, and God was saying to you, it's over. And so this was the per- place of execution. To die on a tree in the olive grove of the Mount of Olives was the curse of God on you. Now, the altar of the red heifer was the most holy altar in Israel's history because it was the only place you could have a sacrifice that would reconsecrate and restore the sanctuary and the covenant necessary to rebuild or restore God's holy house because God's people had sinned or because invaders had destroyed it. And so you needed the red heifer sacrifice to build that sanctuary again. Now, on the present site of the Hebrew tabernacle that has been destroyed by Titus, we have the Dome of the Rock. In fact, the very spot where the Ark of the Covenant was carved, a hole, a makon place in Hebrew by Solomon, you can see that. The imprint of that is still on the Dome of the Rock. And so that's how real the Ark of the Covenant is. That rectangle and that picture that you can go online and see is where the Ark was placed, right there on the Dome of the Rock. In fact, the foundation sides of the Most Holy Place are still preserved in, in the cutaways that you can see on the Dome of the Rock. This was real. God was really there, and, and so on. So the sacrifice of the red heifer required a perfectly red heifer, a perfect red heifer without any blemish on it where every hair must be red. Now imagine inspecting a red heifer looking for every single hair to be red. That would take a long time, wouldn't it? It had to be fully red. And red heifers don't come along very often. In fact, they're hard to find. After carefully selecting the female, it was a heifer, a female sacrifice, the priest would sacrifice the red heifer and sprinkle its blood seven times, throwing it toward the temple of Jerusalem like on the great day of atonement. They would then burn it to ashes in the altar pit on the Mount of Olives. That's a yucky kind of thing. But why did they do this? They did it because that was the way you rebooted the sanctuary worship, the way you restored the temple. In some ways, that sacrifice represented hell and all of us who deserved to go there because it was a fire pit that they threw that thing into and it was totally consumed. That sacrifice would burn in a hole in the ground that would remind the Jewish people of the coming fire that would destroy all evil that is hell itself at the end of the millennium according to the book of Revelation. And the Bible is very clear. God's glory, God is a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love intrinsically destroys evil. Our God is holy, but that love hot fire of God has been looking for centuries to save every man and woman from his glory that destroys evil. Christ is the way out of the woods. According to the Hebrew Mishnah, this sacrifice was used only nine times in Israel's history. Nine times. 
Nine is an in- Now, by the way, what does nine come before? Help me count here. What no- number does nine come before? Number 10. N- nine is an incomplete number for God's will. It's an incomplete number for God's covenant. So the fact that there were nine deaths of the red heifer, nine times they did this, implied there was a need to complete it with number 10. Christ is number 10. And so the last offering, number 10, that is the offering of the red heifer, is itself pointing forward to Jesus. We are told in the Bible that the altar of the red heifer was used for the purification of coming into contact with the dead. It was, on, it was the only female offering in Israel's history. Have you ever heard that all the offerings were male goats and all this? You ever hear that? Well, it's not true. The altar of the red heifer was a female offering. And we must examine why that is so. In some ways, in fact, the only other alt- offering that was female besides the altar, the offering of the red heifer, would be the offering that Abraham made when God made a covenant with him in Genesis 15. In some ways, it resembles the sacrifice of the heifer, as I said in Genesis 15, when a female heifer and a, 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 well, a heifer and a female goat and some other animals were sacrificed in the night of Abraham's terror, and there God met him, and God made a covenant with him, and God passed between the parts of the animal to say that if I don't keep my covenant, may I be executed and cut in two. And then God promised him the promised land in the language of Eden. The Bible's quite clear that when God makes promises to take Abraham and his children to a land, the future, it's Eden restored that they're going to come up with. Now let's go to Numbers 19 and look at the red heifer. Let's zero in on it in our Bible this morning. Now, verse 2 is where I'll, we'll land together. It says, This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect. So every hair had to be red. In which there is no blemish and upon which a yoke has never come. And you shall give her to Eliezer the priest, and she shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of her blood with his finger and sprinkle some of her blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. And the heifer shall be burned in his sight, her skin, her flesh, and her blood with her dung shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet stuff. Now remember, hyssop was used when Jesus was crucified. Uh, a spring of hyssop with vinegar, hyssop and scarlet stuff, and cast them into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Now, hyssop is a symbol of healing, and so the fire and healing are, are together. Now, the ashes of the red heifer would be collected for the purification of sin and for the purification of those who would come into contact with a dead body. That's strange that they'd have an, alt, an offering like this for people who touched a carcass that there would be a purification water for them based on the ashes of the red heifer. Now, Numbers 19, 9, and 11, and 12. Let's continue. And a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them where? What does it say? Outside the camp. Now, that's the language of Hebrews. In a clean place, and they shall be kept for the congregation of the people of Israel for the water of impurity for the removal of sin. Verse 11, he who touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean for how many days? Seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on what day? Third day. Now, I happen to know that Jesus rose on what day? Third day. And then on the seventh day. Now, what day is that? And it's Sabbath. See, we're talking about the resurrection day number and the Sabbath day number. That's the day for cleansing and healing. And so be clean. I like that. And so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day, on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Imagine living all your life and not being clean. You needed the water that came from the sacrifice of the red heifer. Now the book of Hebrews echoes the language of the red heifer when it refers to Jesus' death outside the gate. Go with me to Hebrews 13. Look at verse 10 to 13. Paul says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Now that they were burned historically right there in the pit of the altar of the red heifer at the summit of the Mount of Olives. It says, so Jesus also suffered where? What does it say in your Bible? Where did he suffer? Outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. 
Now here is the call of Paul to those early Christians who were stuck on that old city, who wanted to stay sacrificing animals in Jerusalem. He said, therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. The book of Hebrews is here indicating that Jesus is the fulfillment of the sacrifice of the red heifer at the altar of the red heifer outside the gate where the ashes are collected, where the bodies of the sacrifices were burned. That means, friends, Jesus died at the summit of the Mount of Olives near the altar of the red heifer. So if I were to ask you, what is Mount Calvary? Based on this evidence in Hebrews 13, what would you say? The Mount of Olives. Now, how many of you have been to Jerusalem? You saw that place that looks like a skull, and you felt like you came to Golgotha, the place of the skull. You ever seen that? Well, it didn't look like a skull 2,000 years ago. It didn't look anything like a skull. The topography has changed. So we shouldn't go by that. We should allow the Bible to guide us to the places that really inform us what is going on. So it means, based on Hebrews, that Jesus died at the sum of the Mount of Olives near the altar of the red heifer. That means the Mount of Olives is altar zero for God. It's ground zero. It's where God got it done for the human race. In recent years... Melchizedek's ancient altar and temple complex has been discovered under the grounds, because they've built these things up over the years, under the ground, just over the spring, Kidron, that, or at least in conjunction to its headwaters, that flows to the Dead Sea. It has been found. In fact, it's aired on a number of Christian radio uh, broadcasts. I have looked at the evidence of this. I concur that this is Melchizedek's altar. And the archaeologist, the Jewish archaeologist who found it, is called it Altar Zero or Temple Zero. But that is not the case. In fact, in that altar, you'll see a very simple place for the sacrifice of animals, cutting them in part. You'll see a stone for oil being poured on it like Jacob did. There's nothing pagan about it. This is the first altar that existed in the land of Salem in the days of Melchizedek when Abram was there. They have found that thing. Friend, the most holy altar of all is not that altar. The most holy altar of all was at the summit of the Mount of Olives. And that is the place where Jesus died according to the Bible. It is the real altar zero. The Mount of Olives was so important to Jesus in his life and death. Jesus would sleep there at night, all night. That was the place he hung out. Jesus would go to pray there, the Mount of Olives, his prayer garden place. Jesus would retire there when he was attacked by others. The homeless Jesus made his home in the garden on the Mount of Olives where he had no place to lay his head but on the ground right there. The place he lingered, the place where he prayed for the sins of the world, the place that was called Gethsemane, the oil praise press in Aramaic, precious to him. Christ was arrested there on the Mount of Olives. Christ came over the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem to be tried and then rushed to the eastern gate after his conviction to die on the Mount of Olives. Jesus left the earthly city Jerusalem behind as a forsaken city as he led his disciples over the Mount of Olives then to descend to heaven. Now when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's very clear that the Roman centurion recognized and those that were there, they saw that the veil of the temple had been rent. There's only one spot where you can see the veil of the temple and that's at the summit of the Mount of Olives near the red heifer. When they performed that sacrifice, they would signal to a priest at the door that the sacrifice had been completed. It is a line sight view to the veil. And Josephus, the great Jewish historian, tells us 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, which places us right in Daniel 9's chronology of Christ's death, the great stone lintel that held the single veil of, of, of the Temple of Herod cracked because of an earthquake and it broke and of course the veil was rent in top to bottom as a result of that. So we have historical confirmation of the New Testament witness that the veil was ripped but they saw it from the summit of the Mount of Olives. When the graves were opened at Jesus' resurrection the graveyard was the Mount of Olives. So Jesus left the earthly city Jerusalem behind as a forsaken city as he led his disciples over the Mount of Olives to ascend to heaven, he, he moved in the direction of the Shekinah glory in him to leave the city, as Ezekiel had prophesied, from the Mount of Olives. Now, friends, Jesus was crucified on a tree and a cross. The Bible says both. So what does that mean? There were lots of trees on the Mount of Olives. In fact, 
it was the custom to execute people by putting them right in the tree of an olive tree and placing the cross beam of their cross right there. So Christ was most likely crucified in just that way. So Jesus would have carried his large cross beam on his back, his cross. It would have been placed in the branches of an olive tree. And there he would have been nailed to the tree and the cross is the same thing. Friend, Jesus carried his cross beam on his back. And they hung that cross beam in the branches of the tree. And the tree that is the cross that brought his death is the tree of life for you and me. Very likely, two thieves were nailed to the same tree on different cross beams. And that's why it would be easy to hear each other and talk to each other on the cross. Imagine being that close to the two thieves. One to the right, one to the left, all on the same tree, different crosses. Yet one thief cursed Jesus like we all have in life and our anger and our self-centered unbelief and evil. Haven't you ever gotten mad at God and kind of said, oh, God, you know. Right? Oh, yeah, we've done that too. Now, it's okay to be honest with God, but don't give up your faith in God when you're struggling like that. That thief did. What's the use? I'm dying. And yet one thief, moved by the love of God, confessed Jesus as Lord, as we all should do. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I will. When Jesus died, he said, you're going to be there. When Jesus died on that cross, travelers to Jerusalem, coming to the city of the Passover, could not help but notice that his cross hung on that olive tree near the altar of the red heifer, just to the side along the southern ridge line, facing the veil of the temple. And they would naturally associate his death with that altar, the red heifer, right there, right near it. And so there is an altar outside the gate where he was taken to and he was crucified, and that is our, our altar. So what does it mean? Why is the altar of the red heifer so important in the book of Hebrews? Two ideas meet in the sacrifice of the red heifer that means everything to us who need to be saved by the sacrifice of Jesus. How many of you really want to be saved? Are you, I'm in that group. You look in the mirror and you realize, I've messed up in life. I can think of awful sins, not so awful sins, but any one of them is good enough. And I'm just to keep me out of the kingdom. And we need that grace in our life, the acceptance component. Well, the altar of the red heifer takes us back to the first sins of the human race. The first idea is the idea of red, Adam. The second idea is the idea of heifer. And the heifer is feminine. Now let's look at the first idea. The red heifer was the Adam heifer. And Adam was a man like us men. Men, raise your hands. How many men in the church today? Don't be afraid of being a man. Raise your hand up high, okay? I, I like my masculinity. I'm a man. No one said amen to that. Come on. Come on. But, but the heifer is feminine. Let, put, men, put your hands down, okay? Like many women here today, women, raise your hands high, daintily as you should. How many of you are grateful that you're a woman? Now, men say amen for them. We're grateful for them. Adam wasn't the first to sin. Who sinned first? We're not picking on the woman here. Who sinned first? Eve. Eve's name means life. Adam's wife became his life. He renamed her life. So really, the word captures the essence of Adam and Eve, the Adam heifer. And thus, the, the, the masculine Adam and the feminine Eve, the feminine heifer. Thus, the sacrifice of the red heifer takes us all the way back to Eden, where Adam and Eve sinned against God together. The red heifer is the sacrifice for the purification from sin, the defilement that comes because of human contact with the dead. Now, how many of you have ever had to touch someone? You don't have to raise your hand. I know. Many of us have had to touch people who have died. I have been called to the homes of people who were dying. And I have learned over the years as a pastor not to run from death when I'm ministering to families. I've been in homes where I have been there as that person expired. And I've helped to remove bodies from homes of people who have died in, in the Sligo Church and other places. I've been at the hospital side of people who have died. I don't leave to let them die alone. If they're going to die and I'm around, I want to be there with them because I want to talk about Jesus. I want them to hear everything they can about God's assurance. I want them to know that I'm not leaving because the Lord hasn't left them. I'm a symbol of that in those times, if possible. None of us can orchestrate our lives perfect, perfectly. And when I do that, I, I, I've had to actually, I remember having to help pick the, the body of a young woman out of her bed. 
with the, with the professionals that came there, put her in this basket that they zipped it up to remove her. And you know, at first I got real uncomfortable with that. Then I thought real hard about it. Those children saw me helping to minister to her mother in death. And I hope they remember that. That the church cared about them. So we've all come into contact with the dead, haven't we, in some way? But in the more profound sense, we've come into contact with the dead through Adam and Eve. We carry in us the genetic code. We carry the very material, the, the, the atomic material of Adam and Eve in us. We live every day in contact with the dead, the first sinners of the human race. Why? Because we carry their DNA inside of us. It works in us, but it's dead for them. Adam and Eve's DNA has morphed over the centuries after Noah left the ark, but it is there in all of us here today. Some of us have Denisovan DNA in us. How many of you are from um, Asia, maybe northern Euro uh, Russia, the Slavic people? Anybody like that? Asia, not yeah, maybe southern Asia, but it comes down through Malaysia and so on, and the Aborigines have the most of it. The Denisovans are the post-flood human beings. They, they were eight feet tall. They have found jewelry of the Denisovans that requires high velocity drilling. They very likely are the masterminds that created the pyramids and other things like this. The children of Noah right after the flood, I believe. Others have Neanderthal DNA. Neanderthals are, are kind of like a stocky human form that are three times as strong as most people, perfectly suited for the ice age that followed the flood. They were just as smart as us. Uh, it matters how you view beauty, but they were more stocky in their appearance, and they could whip any of us in terms of uh, close up. They were so powerfully strong. And then there's uh, also the Homo erectus DNA, sloped uh, skull humanity, probably from some form of deficiency. It becomes a genetic characteristic. Homo florensius, the hobbit people that have been found, that were short people. I mean, early, the early earth after the flood was like Tolkien's Middle Earth. You had giants, you had little hobbit people, and you had people in between. As it kind of worked out what would become us over time, we carry in us Denisovan DNA, Neanderthal DNA, but mostly what we call Cro-Magnon Homo sapien DNA. It's pretty much the same. Now, friend, it doesn't really matter all of them and all of us are still children of Adam and Eve in some way. And we have all been defiled by the dead DNA record that is in us that touches us all the time, that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve who sinned against God. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When Jesus died, Jesus' death was horrible beyond belief because in his death, Christ embraced the life the consciousness, the sin of every human being from Adam to the end. He lived our lives in his head from Gethsemane to the cross, according to the book of Isaiah. And when he was done, there was nothing left to condemn. He had recaptured the human race in his heart and his life. Friend, Jesus died on Mount Calvary, which is also called Golgotha, the hill of the skull. When you read your Bible, isn't that what it says? The hill of the skull? Now that's why when you go to Palestine, you see that nice little hill that looks like a skull, you say, that's it. But that's not really what it means. We often think of that place as the place that looks like a skull in its typography. But that is not what the early Christians thought at all. And the place now identified didn't look like it that back then. They knew in their ancient Jewish tradition, when Noah got on the ark with his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that the bones of Adam were too precious to leave behind. And according to really pervasive Jewish understanding, Noah divided up the bones of Adam after the flood and gave to his son Shem Adam's skull. But to Shem, who received the birthright of Genesis 9, he, was, he said that Canaan will be your slave. And for that reason, most of Jewish rabbinical thought believes that Shem became Melchizedek. Shem will live... To, the, to see Jacob at his 50th birthday. He lives to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the genealogical flow of his life. And Noah predicted he would end up in the land of Canaan because Canaan would be a slave, Japheth as well. 
Now, we know that there were very tall uh, ancestors of these people there because when Noah encounters them in, not Noah, when, when Moses encounters them in the Exodus, they're called the Anakim, the long-necked ones, the tall ones, the big ones, giants, very likely post-Denisovan or Denisovan humanity. Now, according to Jewish tradition, Shem, who is most likely Melchizedek, took Adam's skull, brought it to the land of Canaan. And by the way, this is in the Seventh-day Adventist commentary, what I'm sharing with you. I'm not dreaming up this insight. Our, some, uh, Siegfried Horn and others who put that commentary together recognize that this is a valid reason for it being called the Hill of the Skull. So according to Jewish tradition, they took Adam's skull, they brought it to the land of Canaan, where he himself would become a king in fulfillment of Noah's prophecy, that Canaan would become his slave. Melchizedek was king over the Canaanites in Salem, later called Jerusalem. And according to the ancient Jewish tradition, Shem Melchizedek, as I said, buried Adam's skull near Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. One early first Christian witness identifies the place where Adam's skull was buried as the Mount of Olives. Now that's just historical fact I'm sharing with you. And they, when they wrote the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they're not ignoring that. They're validating that. Why would you take Adam's skull and bury it on the Mount of Olives? I'm going to ask you that question. Why would you do that? Why would you go out of your way to put it in a certain spot? Well, so it could be resurrected. You could bury him anywhere and be resurrected, though I'm not trying to you know, argue with you. Wouldn't you want to return it to where it came from? Where was Adam created? In the Garden of Eden. Where did Jesus suffer our sins for our sins? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was enamored with that garden. You would return it to the place where it came from. Because in some way, you're on a mission to put it back. There's plenty of evidence in the Bible that would equate Mount Zion with Eden, the holy land of Eden. I don't have a chance to develop that here, but very strong in Scripture. Like one place says, you are in the holy mountain of God, you are in Eden in Ezekiel 28. Correlations like that. We know in the book of Ezekiel that Jesus will come at the end. And when evil must be destroyed, which is the end of the millennium, there will be a new temple. And we know in the book of Zechariah that his feet will touch the Mount of Olives when he returns at the end of the millennium. And it calls him Yahweh. You know, some, we, we know in the spirit of prophecy that Jesus' feet will touch the Mount of Olives. And there are some Seventh-day Adventists who say Jesus is not Yahweh, Jehovah. I mean, they aren't really good Seventh-day Adventists in their theology. But if we take the spirit of prophecy seriously, that Jesus' feet will touch the, the Mount of Olives, then we must accept that Jesus is Jehovah, Yahweh, God, based on the Zechariah. Look at Zechariah 14.3. Then the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, all capital letters, will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. And on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west to be a very wide valley so that one half of the mountain shall withdraw northward and the other half, half southward. When those wounded feet touch the feet, Mount of Olives at the end of the millennium, when Christ comes to earth to stay, God will smooth the place out for something to land and stay there. What is the highest mountain in the world today? Does anybody know? Be careful with your answer. What is the highest mountain in the world today? Is it Mount Everest or Mount Calvary? Which one's the highest mountain? It's Mount Calvary. And the Mount of Olives is Mount Calvary. Revelation 21.10, and in the Spirit he carried me, John the Revelator, away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. When Jesus' feet will touch the Mount of Olives, it will split, and there the holy city will descend. When the holy city comes down, the book of Revelation describes it as a new Eden, where God's throne will be planted for all eternity, where Jesus died. Now God's not going to plant the new Eden where Eden was not. Where Eden was, Eden will be again, but it will be the new Eden. The river of life will flow from the throne of God, the lamb in the new, in, in the new city that lands, it will flow from the throne of God and the lamb in the new city as it lands on the Mount of Olives. So those early Christians are right. The new Jerusalem is to the east of the old Jerusalem. It will be ground zero there because that is the place for altar zero where Jesus died for you and me and the whole world too. For this reason, the Christians 
for the first 300 years of the Christian faith, look to the Mount of Olives for the new Jerusalem, the city that is to come. Turn with me to Revelation 22, verse 1. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from what? Identify this with me. Flowing from the throne of God, but it's not just God's throne. What else is it? And of the Lamb. It doesn't say thrones. It says throne. One throne. It's God's throne. It's the Lamb's throne. They share it. Through the middle of the street of the city, and the river of life is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit river, symbolized by maybe a physical river, will flow from that throne throughout the entire universe. Verse 2. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. Where have we seen the tree of life in the Bible? Back in Eden. Yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There shall no more be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall worship Him. Eden is going to be right there on the Mount of Olives. It's going to be where that new Jerusalem city lands, where the great judgment will occur as people come to life at the end of the millennium. They will come and be judged right there where Jesus died. When that holy city comes down, Jesus' feet, as I said, will touch the very spot He died on. Where He died on the cross of Calvary, place of Adam's skull for the sins of the world. And that moment, the Mount of Olives will split at that moment, open and the throne of God will rest there and it will never move again. And there the tree of life will be found, the river of life, Eden restored because of the cross. The carpenter king died on a tree to give us life. Paradox, that will be his throne. If you were God, where would you put your throne for all eternity? Can I ask you that question? Would you put it in some obscure place in Siberia? Would you stick it at the South Pole? Would you go along with the Superman stuff and have your fortress of solitude in the North Pole? Or would you plant it where it ought to be, where you lost your son and got him back on the summit of the Mount of Olives? What is the most important real estate in the universe? It's the summit of the Mount of Olives. Friends, it's not the place where it's got to be the place where Jesus died for you, where he prayed for you, where he was resurrected, where he ascended. The Mount of Olives is ground zero for us. Gaga, the place of Adam's skull, Mount Calvary, the highest mountain on planet Earth. The cross became Jacob's ladder that goes from heaven to earth because Christ is the ladder. It is the place where Jesus went to hell for us in the pit of the altar of the red heifer where he experienced our condemnation, where he was consumed in his mind by the fires of our personal guilt, our alienation that condemns us everyone without a Savior who dies for us. It is the place where Jesus became a zero to give you and me everything for all eternity. Jesus plus your zero means everything. Alter zero is eternity. It is the place where Christ cried out in the agonies of final judgment when he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you thrown me out of Eden to die for the dead? Why has all the sins from Adam to the end come into my head, my skull, where Adam's skull is buried just beneath my feet? You go to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, they actually have the mosaic of the cross and Adam's skull right there at his feet, third, fourth century mosaic, where all the dead and living inside of me, as I relive their lives, Father, one by one, as if I am them, as if I sinned against you as them, I feel like I'm them. I didn't sin, Father. They all sinned, and I didn't sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I feel like all of them is in me, and yes, they are. They're here in me. They are inside of me, every human being. I feel it. I can see their lives. Eternity is in my head, and I am dying as them. Adam and Eve is in me, Father. Noah is in me. Every Denisovan is in me. Caiaphas is in me. I wish he had turned to me. Every Neanderthal is in me. Every other person down the timeline to the end is in me. Both Jew and Gentile, they're in me. Father Mike Oxentenko is in me. That is the place where God lost his son. And the son lost his father. And the Holy Spirit who lost, was lost to the son also when Jesus said, My God, my God, my God the Father. My God the Holy Spirit, why have you forsaken me? at Alto Zero on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will be the place where all three will reign as one. 
Again, at the throne of God and the Lamb, where the Spirit flows to every soul in the universe with grace and life. And that, at that costly throne of the Trinity, it will have a divine function for all eternity to lead us to the cross. To lead us to the place of the cross. People will come to the throne of God and the Lamb. Men and women and children, all God's children who are saved, will come one by one to God's throne to meet their Father on the throne and to meet His Son. And they will sit on that holy throne with God Almighty and His precious Son, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, right there with all, where it all happened, where the Father and the Son lost each other in the darkness of the cross, but where they found us in the light of the cross. How do I know that we will sit on God's throne in this way? I know it because Jesus says so in the book of Revelation. Turn to Revelation 3, 21 and 22. Christ is very clear in the book of Revelation that the throne of God and the Lamb is one throne. Now look at this. He who conquers, he's speaking to the latency in church, I will grant him to sit with me where? What does he say? On my throne as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. It's the same throne in the book of Revelation. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And why will they sit on God's throne at the very spot where Jesus died on the cross of Calvary? I think I know why. Because right there where God lost his son, as the sacrifice of the red heifer at altar zero. The Father will put his arms around you and me, and Jesus will do the same. It will be a family hug that is tight and right. And the Father will hold you tight, and Jesus also, as they tell you just how precious you are to them as God. And there they will tell us all, one by one, as if the whole universe doesn't matter, and only us, the old, old story of God's love, of Jesus' faithfulness, and how they got it done in pain and suffering, just for you and just for me, in the darkness of the cross, which is the place of God's eternal throne. And for all eternity, we will go again and again to the throne to hear it over and over again as the river flows, as the river flows through it, as the years of eternity roll on and on and on, as we come closer and closer to God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ, through the cross of Christ, which is the throne of God. Dear heart, God has an appointment with you right there at the throne at the spring of eternal life. Our communion service is really a temporary meeting with God. The big one is coming. He has an appointment with you at His throne. Don't miss your appointment with the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. They will be waiting for you on the throne at the top of the Mount of Olives at the end of the millennium at altar zero, altar zero. And so the book of Revelation says appropriately, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who is thirsty come and take the water of life freely without price. I want to come. And one way we come is when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we come to the Lord. My name is Pastor Michael Oxentanko, and we're just so happy that you're checking into our sermon content at Reaching Hearts SDA Church on YouTube. I want to really encourage you to hit the subscribe button. And if you want more of our preaching, teaching, just go to the playlist and, and you'll see it laid out there. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our gospel preaching, teaching ministry.